Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am Jim Healy, today's Master of Ceremonies, and it is my great privilege to welcome you to today's wonderful festivities. Our ceremony will begin in a few moments. For the comfort and enjoyment of all our guests, we ask that you now turn off all cell phones, pagers, and radios. We thank you for your cooperation. Please note a professional photographer will be taking individual pictures of students as they receive their white coats. A website address where pictures may be purchased will be provided to students next week. And of course, to revisit this special day, today, tomorrow, and every other day, we invite you to log on to our website. The address is umassmed.edu, and you will find a full video of today's ceremony. If you wish to purchase the video, there is also a link to an order form. Thank you. We will be starting shortly. Please join me in welcoming the 2014 recipient of the Chancellor's Medal for Distinguished Service, carrying the University Mace and leading our procession, Dr. Michelle Pugner. Ladies and gentlemen, the School of Medicine, class of 2018.
Please welcome the faculty of the University of Massachusetts, Worcester. Finally, our speaker, the 2013 recipient of the Chancellor's Medal for Distinguished Clinical Excellence, Dr. Richard S. Irwin, and the distinguished leadership of our campus. Good afternoon, everyone. I have the great privilege to serve as the Chancellor of the University of Massachusetts Medical School, and it's a distinct pleasure to welcome all of you here this afternoon to our white coat ceremony. We're gathered here today to observe, commemorate, and indeed celebrate our first year medical students' transition to the medical profession. The white coat, which you will soon adorn, is an apt and appropriate metaphor for such an important transition upon which you are embarking. You will undoubtedly wear many white coats during your professional career, but each one will symbolize your professionalism, the virtue of your medical calling, the trust that defines the patient-physician covenant, and the recognition that it's a privilege for us to care for our patients and not a privilege for our patients to be cared for by us. To wear this white coat means you have chosen to dedicate your lives to the needs of others. It means that you've entered a profession that demands you take on additional competencies. To wear this white coat means you must be uncompromising in your commitment to evidence-based care and to the standards of our profession, that you must rely on sound judgment, that you must always place the needs of your patients first, especially when faced with the reality that you derive your livelihood from caring from those who will benefit from your professional skills. To wear this white coat means that the fascination of science awaits you. To wear your white coat means you must be genuinely committed to lifelong learning. As stewards of this public medical school, we're so pleased to welcome you into our medical community and to guide you toward a career of learning and caring for others. It's a great pleasure now to welcome Dr. Terrence Flott, the Dean of the School of Medicine, to the podium to offer a personal for a reflection. Dean Flott. First, I just want to add my welcome to all of you. It's great to see uh, so many parents and friends here, and certainly I uh, want to welcome our first-year students and our faculty as well. I I'm grateful to all of you uh, that we have the privilege and honor to be a part of this special day and reflect together uh, on our commitment to our patients and to the profession of medicine. And again, congratulations to all of you on the occasion of receiving your white coats. Um, Sure, it's obvious, but wearing the white coat means that you're becoming a physician. You're becoming a real doctor. Here at UMass, we define that role around six competencies as a professional that you'll put your patient's needs above your own. 
as a scientist bringing to bear the latest evidence to offer to them the best possible care. As a clinical problem solver to apply the scientific principles of medicine to complex, sometimes messy, real world settings. As a communicator to listen as well as share our clinical insights in collaboration with our patients. And as advocates speaking up publicly for issues that touch the health and welfare of our patients. My main point today though relates to none of these but to the sixth competency physician as person and I want to illustrate that with the story of the first white coat I ever uh, really saw up close. Uh, that uh, first white coat I ever saw was that of Thomas Garvey who was my own pediatrician. I remember Dr. Garvey's office vividly. I remember the smell of alcohol that would greet me in the exam rooms. I remember the dry wooden tongue depressors. I still sort of feel them on my tongue. And, and the crinkly white paper on the exam table. But mostly I remember Dr. Garvey himself when he would come in with his long white coat, his thick framed glasses. He was always cheerful. He was always comforting uh, to me. He, he did also always leave the dirty work of those injections to his nurse. Uh, well, well, I was very healthy, I, I think, as a child. He did guide me through several rough spots, a, a severe bee sting reaction, an extensive second degree burn, an ongoing struggle with childhood obesity, just to name a few. But this, I thought, this is what a doctor really is. Smarter than the rest of us, powerful enough to treat me with painful injections and awful tasting medications, I distinctly recall him being at least seven feet tall, larger than life. In those days, uh, uh, continuity of care, child care really more or less ended at age five when the uh, required immunizations of the time ended. And the last time I recall seeing Dr. Garvey was when he paid his respects uh, at my father's funeral when I was 14. That event was a blur, but he still looked the same to me, larger than life more of a semi-divine being than a person. Now, when I decided to go to medical school, I did not consciously say to myself, I want to be just like Dr. Garvey, but the deep impressions from my childhood of the physician that he was were hard to erase. I didn't really have other uh, images or role models of physicians close to me in my family. So as it ended up, after struggling with a lot of advice from others that I should do otherwise, uh, I ultimately decided to become a pediatrician. Just before our medical school graduation, I was informed that I would receive the Greater New Orleans uh, Pediatric Society Award, given to the most promising graduate from our med school going into peds. I was invited to the society's annual banquet, which was not very memorable, but in the parking lot, I did have a very memorable encounter. A thin, tan, well-groomed older man, a few inches shorter than myself, approached. He was dressed in a very, very sporty golf attire. Terrence, it's Tom Garvey, he said. I did a double take. The voice was definitely Dr. Garvey's, but I hadn't been called Terrence by anyone but my mother for the last 10 years. And uh, when did Dr. Garvey shrink from seven feet to five, nine? <laughs> but, but most striking, where was the white coat? Uh, this memory really struck me. Uh, not just because Dr. Garvey was such an archetypal figure in my early life, but also because over time, I, I came to realize a lesson that's proven very important to me. This man was able to be both a great physician in the white coat, my Dr. Garvey, and a healthy, well-balanced human being not wearing the white coat. Uh, he was a rejuvenated 70-ish Tom Garvey that I met uh, in that parking lot who had gotten in better shape, told me he was jogging, he really was taking care of himself. And this was my first lesson really in the sixth competency, physician as first person. This competency helps us to recognize that if we are stronger and more whole as persons, we can bring to our, what we can bring to our patients is richer and more complete. It's difficult to balance at times, but uh, I'm sure it's a balance that all of you will try to master. So just remember, uh, we are so privileged to wear the white coat and to be invited into the lives of our patients and families, but one more thing to remember is that the coat can come off. Tom Garvey learned that. I'm still trying to learn that myself. But one last thought that I do want to leave with you, 
is that uh, when the white coat comes off, none of you is, none of us, none of us is perfect. And I, and I do want to say to you all, the students and to the mentors of the learning community, that I recognize uh, the imperfections of, uh, of what I do in leadership and administration, and particularly what arises when we try to do the crucial work that we're doing in a setting where we reach the limitations uh, of our resources. But I do think there's a greater lesson in that as well. The ideal of the white coat and the struggle to live up to that ideal must be maintained, even when those coats, imperfect as they are, pick up a few spots and stains, as fully human and imperfect persons, all we can do is the best that we can do. And that's part of the lesson of being a person. Again, thank you all for your attention. Uh, congratulations to all of you, and I appreciate being part of this. Thank you. At last year's convocation ceremony, I had the privilege of presenting the Chancellor's Medal for Distinguished Clinical Excellence to a most worthy faculty member. By way of introducing this esteemed faculty member, we're going to now show a brief video clip from last year's medal presentation. I'd like to ask you now to please turn your attention to one of the monitors. This year's recipient of the Chancellor's Medal for Clinical Excellence is an accomplished, intellectually curious, highly respected master clinician with a remarkable record for clinical and educational service to the medical profession and our institution, Dr. Richard Earle. You have been described by your patients as the very model of a physician that every doctor should try to emulate. Professional, compassionate, and caring. You are held in their highest esteem as your sincerity and complete dedication to your patients has earned their trust and confidence throughout your distinguished career. Kindness is your standard. Excellence is your expectation. Patient-centered care is your focus. You have embraced interdisciplinary collaboration in your philosophy of care as a professor in our Graduate School of Nursing and in our School of Medicine. Clearly, you recognize and promote the impact of team on the health and well-being of patients in the critical care, acute care, and ambulatory settings. Your transformative vision has been to achieve the highest possible quality of care by standardizing patient care across diverse units with the aim that all patients will receive the same high quality and patient-focused care regardless of the unit to which they were admitted. Richard, it's a great privilege to invite you to address our first year students and their families next year at their white coat ceremony. This is a fitting recognition for one who has worn the white coat with dignity, all the while recognizing the privilege in doing so. Please accept my congratulations as this year's recipient of the Chancellor's Medal for Distinguished Clinical Excellence. The, podium, the 2013 recipient of the Chancellor's Medal for Distinguished Clinical Excellence, Dr. Richard Irwin. Richard. Thank you very much. Uh, Chancellor Collins, class of uh, 2018, uh, Chancellor Collins, Dean Flott, Dr. Dixon, faculty, and guests. What I'd like to share with you are my thoughts about medicine in the second millennium. There are many who think that um, it's a revolutionary period in American medicine. What I'd like to do in making this presentation is to pose and then answer a series of questions. The slide does not seem to be advancing. <laughs> ah. 
do we have quality health care today? I think the answer to that is probably in the eyes of the beholder. Um, there are many observers who have made many comments, and what I've done is uh, chosen uh, just a few uh, to relate to you. In Time to Heal, Dr. Kenneth Ludmerer, an eminent internist, historian of medicine, and medical educator, has written a comprehensive critique of the history of American medical education in the 20th century. As the book ends, it's the late 1990s, a time Dr. Ludmerer refers to as a pre-revolutionary period because it's marked by unrest, turbulence, and disintegration of existing institutions, but not yet by a platform or model. Dr. Ludmerer writes critically of all stakeholders, including society and the medical profession at large. With respect to the medical profession, he describes turf battles that appear to be more intense than ever before because generalists are doing more specialty care, specialists are doing more primary care, specialists are competing for a variety of body parts, and many physicians are concerned that their roles may be diminished by nurse practitioners and physician assistants. Some of this is actually still going on. Dr. Ludmerer goes on to state that while radical changes will be taking place in the future, he is uncertain as to what those changes will be. What about some others? What about our families and patients, patient advocacy organizations and the Institute of Medicine? Well, they have actually spoken, and they're also concerned about the deficiencies of the practice of modern American medicine because it's not consistently patient-focused, compassionate, sensitive to the everyday and special needs of patients and their families. Based upon the best available evidence, it's not interprofessional, meaning collaborative, and it's not necessarily safe. Some think that physicians can be bought because of their relationships with industry. And here we see a cartoonist picking up on that. So the little kid says, I love NASCAR, can I have your autograph? And the conflicted physician says, sorry kid, I'm a doctor who's actually taking money from a variety of different pharmaceutical companies. What should we call this revolutionary period in American medicine? I believe we can call it and should call it the era of patient-focused care. Well, what is patient-focused care? It's the care defined from the patient's perspective. There's been a lot of scholarly work that actually began in the 1950s that's revealed the following. It embodies the three C's of communication, continuity of care, and concordance of expectations, meaning the physician and the patient need to find the common ground. It leads to significant improvements in patient outcomes. And patients prefer it over physician-centered, technology-based, disease-focused models. Well, how do we get physicians to embrace and practice patient-focused care? This is a task for all stakeholders, I believe, but especially you, me, and the patients. And the patients need to become informed about best practices and patient-focused care standards. They need to let physicians know when their needs and expectations are not being met. What does patient-focused care mean to me? I believe that patient-focused care is the care we want our families to receive all of the time. I don't mean to imply that it's the care we want just for our blood relative families. It's the care we want all of our families, uh, all of our patients, and their families to receive. Let me provide you with some specific personal examples. This is my wife, Diane. As a point of reference, she's the one on the right. <laughs> if my wife, Diane, or your spouse, respectfully requests that a staff anesthesiologist rather than a less experienced physician be the one to insert an intravenous catheter prior to surgery, I hope that her wish will be honored. I also hope that should Diane forget to bring a referral from her primary care physician for an office visit with a specialist, that the office staff of the specialist will help her get the referral right then and there rather than send her home. This is my mother. She's passed away, but she was 96 at the time this picture was taken. If my 96-year-old mother, Sylvia Irwin, or your mother, 
is 30 minutes late for an appointment in a hospital clinic because there's a long line at the registration desk, I would hope that she would be seen despite being unavoidably late for her appointment. It's also my hope that when my mom calls her physician, the office phone is answered by a pleasant human being and that her physician returns calls when he says that he will. This is my sister, Bobby. If my sister, Bobby Pollock, or your sister or brother travels two hours for an appointment and arrives at the doctor's office on the wrong day, I hope that she will be accommodated and seen rather than being sent home because she's cared for by a physician or physician group that practices open access care. And this is my brother-in-law, Dr. Norman Pollock. I'm hoping that my brother-in-law, Dr. Norman Pollock, will never have to see another physician who is so insensitive and preoccupied that he fails to consistently call him by his correct name and fails to put the earpieces of his stethoscope in his ears when listening to his heart. And these are my four daughters. You can only imagine how much those teeth cost. <laughs> If one of my daughters, Rachel, Jamie, Rebecca, or Sarah, or one of your daughters are prescribed a new medication, I hope that the physician will ask them about all the other medications they're taking to make sure that there's no potential life-threatening interaction between drugs. This is one of my sons-in-law, Dr. Andrew Coe. If my sons-in-law, Dr. Andrew Coe, Andrew McIntosh, or Adam Slater, or your son-in-law has to undergo general anesthesia and require anticoagulation to prevent blood clots from forming in their legs. I hope that they will be cared for by a physician who practices medicine according to the best available evidence and who embraces the concept of lifelong learning. And this is another son-in-law, Andrew McIntosh. If my son-in-law, Andrew McIntosh, or your son-in-law is ever sick enough to be on life support in an ICU, I hope that they will be cared for by a compassionate physician who believes in interprofessional collaborative care and is knowledgeable about end-of-life issues and the special needs of the family members. And here's one of my grandsons, Jacob. If one of my grandsons, Benjamin, Jacob, Truman, Bailey, Isaac, Emmer, or Asher, or one of your grandchildren has to be admitted to a hospital, I hope that the hospital has an active and continuous quality improvement program to ensure that the care they receive has the best chance of being of the highest quality and safe. Yes, four daughters and seven grandsons, no granddaughters yet. Well, why have I defined patient-focused care in terms of family, mine, and yours? Well, unless you're an unbelievable, you are a member of a very, un, very dysfunctional family, we should always want the best for our families. It's defined in terms uh, to which all physicians relate. The definition of family, according to Webster's Dictionary, extends to the human race. And if we don't know how to provide patient-focused care in a certain situation, physicians should ask themselves, what would I want another health care provider to do for my mother or father or wife or children or grandchildren? The answer will often be the patient-focused care thing to do. Well, who made me aware of what patient-focused care really is about? Was it my teachers? Was it my dad, Dr. Harold Irwin? Well, I graduated medical school in 1968. I know some of you will start doing the math. Um, and I can tell you that um, we weren't taught patient-focused care. My dad was an internist in solo practice in New London, Connecticut. And while I've subsequently learned that he did practice patient-focused care, I never saw that. All I saw was, when we went into the backyard to play catch, the phone would ring, and I would be left with the ball to throw it against the wall because he would always take off to go take care of a patient. So I was too kid-focused to observe what kind of a physician my father really was. So who and what opened my eyes to what patient-focused care really is all about? And the answer is, it was my mother. In 1981, my dad passed away. He actually passed away in one of our ICUs here. He had been traveling up here from Florida. Um, he had a massive stroke. Um, and um, as the months passed, my sister and I 
were actually perplexed because of the anger that my mother had towards his physicians, not, not up here, but in Florida. When my dad died, my mom actually called the internist and cardiologist who cared for my dad um, in, uh, uh, just north of Fort Lauderdale in Florida. And then when she returned to Florida, um, she uh, expected to get a phone call. Um, she expected to get a note. And she got none of that. And as my sister and I continued to talk to my mother, it became very clear to us that my mom and my dad, before he had passed away, really felt that they had invested a lot in their physicians. And when nobody acknowledged the fact that my dad had died to my mother, my mother thought that um, that feeling of uh, being invested was uh, not reciprocal on the part of the healthcare field. And ever since then, um, I awoke to what patient-focused care is. Um, the staff who I work with and I uh, never miss an opportunity to actually pick up the phone when somebody has passed away or somebody has taken a turn for the worse. We often go to calling hours. Um, and uh, when we can, we also go to funerals. Uh, we pick each other up uh, because we, pra we practice uh, interprofessional collaborative care, the nurses, the nurse practitioners, and other physicians uh, in our group. I started also for patients who were near the end, and I knew that they weren't going to last much longer. When I went on trips, I would always uh, try to let them know that I was thinking of them, so I would bring them back something. And um, there was one uh, particular patient, we'll call her Doris, um, who uh, was actually nearing the end. And I remember I had a trip to go to Turkey and had the opportunity to go to uh, the major museum in Ankara. And there in the gift shop, I had the opportunity to see a few uh, oriental, little teeny oriental rugs. And I brought it back for her. And um, she lit up. Uh, she was unbelievably uh, uh, appreciative of the fact that I had been thinking of her. About three or four months later, she passed away. Um, and uh, our staff and I ended up going to her calling hours. And as we came upon the open casket, um, her daughter, oldest daughter, came up and said uh, Doris wanted to uh, be buried with her prized possessions. And so they turn out to be in the casket with her right now. And what was on her chest turned out to be four Almond Joy candy bars. Uh, she really loved them. But they were actually sitting on top of my oriental rug. Um, it is clear that uh, it's important to let people know when you're thinking about them. And when I forget, or I can't make it because I might be out of town, uh, the other staff that know the patients well and consider them to be theirs also, uh, we pick each other up and they do the uh, patient-focused care also. So uh, on your left is Carrie Krikorian, um, who has just retired. And she was a, a pulmonary nurse specialist. And on the right is Cindy French, uh, who's a nurse practitioner. Uh, Cindy's worked with me for 35 years. Uh, she just actually got her PhD from the Graduate School of Nursing uh, this past year. Well, how does one characterize the role that our medical school and medical center have played in the patient-focused care revolution? I think there's a phrase that um, I'll speak to on the next slide, ahead of the curve comes to mind. And there's the word legacy. With respect to being ahead of the curve, our medical school and medical center clearly are patient-centered, interprofessional, and uh, uh, want to teach collaborative care. Our campus is shared with the Graduate School of Nursing and Biomedical Sciences, sciences creating an environment for students to interact, work together, and learn from each other. Our educational program was developed to reinforce a patient-centered model by teaching communication, mindfulness, and empathy as foundation skills. With respect to evidence-based medicine and clinical practice guidelines, we teach these concepts in the classroom and clinical setting and reinforce them in our state-of-the-art simulation center so that students are better prepared to safely care for patients in the real-world setting. And with respect to managing physician industry ties, we are clearly a local and uh, arguably national leader and arguably have the strictest conflict of interest policy, certainly in the state of Massachusetts and perhaps even in the country. With respect to legacy, our medical school, graduate school of nursing, and academic medical center have provided an environment for encouraging patient-centered, compassionate care. The Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare annually honors 
one extraordinary healthcare provider with the Schwartz Center Compassionate Caregiver Award. The award, first given in 1999, is one of the region's most prestigious honors in healthcare. And we should be proud to say that three of our own have been recipients. Of the 14 awards, we've actually gotten it 21% of the time. We've even been told, don't even put up a candidate because we can't keep giving UMass you know, all of these awards. Helen Mullen is a pediatric oncology nurse who still works here, got the award in 2004. Cindy French in 2008, a nurse practitioner, and John Zawaki in 2012, um, a physician. Well, how do we define quality health care? It clearly is in the eyes of the beholder. Based upon the evidence, patients do not believe their care is of the highest quality unless it's patient-focused. And while some patients receive patient-focused care, this cannot be said of American medicine as a whole. So I leave you with this challenge, class of 2018. If we remember an old English proverb recorded in the 12th century, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. My challenge is, be one of the horses who ingest all that the medical school and medical center have to teach. Congratulations. Thank you for your attention. Well done. Thank you very much. Dr. Michael Ennis is a clinical professor in the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health. He's been a member of the medical school community since 1983, having completed both his internship and residency training here. Dr. David Hadem is professor in the Department of Medicine. He joined our faculty at the medical school in 1988. We're privileged to benefit from their leadership in the many ways they contribute to the enrichment of our Academic Health Science Center. And today, I'm pleased to introduce them to you in their roles as co-directors of our learning communities. Dr. Ennis and Hayden, please come forward to continue the ceremony. Welcome and greetings to all. Welcome to Worcester. And, and thank you all for joining us on this special day. I'll be directing my remarks to our first year students, many of whom will soon be having their first patient care experiences. Your house mentor, who will be welcoming you onto this stage, who will be supporting you in your medical school journey from matriculation to graduation, who will be teaching you clinical skills that mentor, who today is um, sporting a long white coat like this one, likely had a time earlier in their career when they were uncomfortable in that white coat. This is a near universal experience, almost a rite of passage for most physicians. When you wear your white coat, much of the public will see you as a doctor. But when you first put it on, many of you are going to feel like it just doesn't fit right. You may very well feel like an imposter in that coat. White coat implies doctor, and you may be thinking, doctor, who, me? What do I know? I'm just a first year medical student. There will be times when your longitudinal preceptor will send you into a, into interview a patient while she goes to see a different patient. Sometimes that patient who you're with will have come to see the doctor with the kind of issue that doesn't lend itself to all those questions you've been learning in the doctoring and clinical skills course. Perhaps the patient's just there for a blood pressure check or an annual physical or to have some form filled out. Or maybe that patient does have a problem like abdominal pain or broken leg, but you've gone through a lot of the questions that you've been learning to ask, and you can't think of anything else. So there you are with that patient, who may be different from you in age and, or gender, different in cultural background or ethnicity, 
an individual with whom you seem to have little in common. You're there wearing your bright new white coat, looking doctorly but feeling really awkward. What to do? Make small talk? Red Sox? Excuse yourself and head for the exit? What I want to submit to you today is that such times are the perfect opportunity to hone one of the most important skills of doctoring, that is, empathy. How do I do that, you might be asking. Well, first, let's just get on the same page about what empathy is. Empathy is not thinking about how you would feel if you had the same problem as the patient in front of you. No, that would be more in the realm of sympathy. <clears throat> Instead, empathy involves understanding the patient's experience or how you would feel if you were, not you, but, if you, but how you would feel if you were that patient. Empathy is imagining how you would feel if you were in the patient's shoes experiencing the same problem. This probably, I bet, sounds like a pretty daunting task. Perhaps you're saying to yourself, I've never had kidney failure. I've never been the parent of a child with cancer. I've never been homeless or elderly. I can't even say systemic lupus or erythematosus, let alone know what it feels like to have that disease. So how can I understand what it's like to be that patient in that situation? To start on the quest, I would suggest you arm yourself with five simple words. What's it like for you? Five short, one-syllable words. What's it like for you? In those awkward moments, with the patient when you've run out of questions about their headache or their cough or the character or consistency of their bowel movements, the opportunity then percolates up for you to use these five simple words. Ask your patient, what's it like for you to have rheumatoid arthritis? Or what's it like for you to have had a heart attack, to live in a shelter, to have a newborn baby? to maintain sobriety, et cetera, et cetera. I doubt you'll ever have a patient who doesn't have something in their life that you could learn more about. Using these five words frequently with patients will make you a better doctor. Try them out. Listening to the answers to these questions will build up your empathy muscles, ultimately making you a more astute clinician. The more you ask your patients about what it is like to be them, what it feels like to be in their shoes, the more comfortable that white coat you're wearing today will eventually fit you. These conversations will not only help you get to know your patient, but will facilitate establishing rapport and building relationships with them and, and will ultimately make your job much more satisfying and rewarding. So like breaking in a new pair of running shoes by going out for a jog, the way to break in this white coat is to ask your patient, what's it like for you? Thank you for your attention. So in the, as co-directors, we get to partner in this venture, and so let me extend my welcome to all of you on this significant event in the beginning of your medical school experience. The White Coat Ceremony is one way of marking the beginning of your professional journey. We've chosen the White Coat as a symbol at this beginning, honoring a long tradition in medicine. And the spectrum of meanings associated with this symbol are broad, from the White Coat as barrier, representing separation and distance from patients to the white coat as a cloak of compassion, emphasizing the kindness and care as value it promotes. 
Mentor opinions vary, ranging from those who tell us that this is one of the few days that they wear their white coat to those who wear it all the time. Pediatricians only know only too well the association that kids form quickly with white coat equals doctor equals shot. Instilling fear is not their goal, so most say they do not wear their white coats. In my practice, I don't often wear a white coat. My patients know who I am. After 10 to 20 years, if they don't, then we have a problem to look into. But I do wear it when I go into the hospital, using it as a uniform so that staff, who I may not work with as consistently, know that I'm a doctor. Not long ago, I went into the hospital to check on the elderly father of a friend, having told her that I would make sure he was getting settled and feeling comfortable in our complex medical system. After our greeting, he looked at me and said, you have a nice clean white coat, doctor. You must not work very hard. <laughs> I can assure you I have, and you will get your white coats dirty with your hard work. Now, there's two features of your white coat that represent part of your new identity. They signify that you will become a physician here at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. The first of these two features is your name. It's written on your white coat. The coat's yours. You are here. You belong. You may not have the skills just yet, but your parents, your college professors, your previous mentors, as well as people here at UMass, recognized your potential. Know that you will grow into that white coat, one step at a time. It will never seem like it's progressing quickly enough, but sooner than you know, you'll be sitting in front of us again at your graduation. The second feature I want to draw your attention to is your new coat's pocket. Look in your pocket. In it, there's the name of a graduated student or students who donated this to you a tradition of passing important things down from one class to another. This is a student just like your mentor and whoever else you may have chosen to cloak you who wishes for your success. Carry that card and carry those people with you. As you wear your white coat and begin your clinical work, you'll look to those pockets for information, trying to carry everything you will need to have key data at your fingertips. I remember one of my mentees who had just started third year. She proudly showed me that the pocket sewn inside her white coat was just large enough to carry her laptop. <laughs> she could carry the web in her pocket. But information alone will not make you a doctor. You'll fill your pockets with additional things. Your pockets will carry the tools of doctoring, your stethoscope, your reflex hammer, your tuning fork, your pen light, things to help you see and hear and feel what is wrong with people who have come to seek your help. Your white coat will allow you entry into places that you most likely have not been before. You'll enter rooms where a new baby has just been born. You will enter rooms as patients take their last breath. You will wonder whether you should be in these rooms. You will wonder what you're doing there. When times like this occur, take a deep breath, look around, notice who is with your patient, notice what people are doing. You should also then take a moment to look in your pocket and remember those graduated students, your mentor, those who cloaked you, those teachers and patients who taught you before. They are all right there with you, encouraging you and witnessing your good work. When you are done in that room, carry that patient with you. Information and the pressure to know will make your pockets seem heavy, even make you feel unbalanced. Caring for patients over time, one by one, with others, carrying their memory and the lessons they have taught you, we hope will make your pockets feel light. This note in your coat pocket is one way that UMass hopes to convey a new meaning with the white coat that of partnership in this journey. This code extends that offer of partnership broadly. The oath that you will recite today is from the class of 2016. Read it. It contains professed values of a class 
and in two short years, you will have written your own, indicating the principles and values that will be important to you. Your oath will be handed down to an incoming class. In the formal cloaking, this will be performed by your learning community mentor and an important person you selected. Some may view this as a handoff from your prior life to your new life. We want you to view this more as partnership. Your mentor, your chosen cloaker, you in the center. We symbolize part of a broad group of people who are behind you, who will support you during your time here. During the reception, introduce your family to your mentors. Help us to formalize this partnership. Help us to support you. Let us begin our work together. As doctors, you will all ultimately make your own decision about wearing a white coat. But in coming here to UMass, we hope that whatever cloak you choose, that it will represent the same values of compassion, caring, and partnership. We all look forward to accompanying you. Thank you. The form of our white coat ceremony this afternoon emphasizes the relationships the learning communities espouse. Students will be called forward by house and will receive their white coat from a person they have chosen and their learning community mentor. Faculty, students, families, and friends are all intertwined and indispensable partners in the journey these young people have chosen to embrace. And so let us begin. Blackstone House, head of house, Dr. Michael Ennis. Dr. Jerry Durbin, mentor. Thomas Ryan Ford. Christine Iris Martin. <laughs> Samuel Harry Mazur. Charles Nasrallah. Evangelia Murray.
Rachel Eileen Stamateris. Dr. Sonia Chiamente, mentor. Courtney Lee Rose Birchall. <laughs> Martin Jude Cotti. Joseph Tanyos Holmesy. Catherine Lee. <laughs> Sarah Servada Lab. Anchor Shiel. Dr. Joyce Rosenfeld, mentor. <laughs> Philip, Philip Andrew Feinberg. <laughs> Elizabeth Sky. For Zaka. Nicole Jeanette Lang. Cassidy Siegel Mellon. <laughs> Nicholas Peter St. Germain.
Jonathan Wook Quang. Michael Ennis, mentor. Katharina Elizabeth Anderson. <laughs> Molly Eileen Kane. Charles Chengyuk Jung. <laughs> Jonathan Murray Durgan. Orgave Ihiosu Ijesurbo. David Latario. <laughs> Michael Christopher Leeson. Burncoat House, Head of House, Dr. David Hatem. Lisa Gussack, Mentor. Nisarg Chaya. Laura DeRocher. Christopher Earls.
Philip Gurner. Justine Kaur. <laughs> Daniel Nathan <laughs> Munger. Noah Jacob Silverstein. <laughs> Jessica Tolson. Dr. Marie Sosa, mentor. Amir Laith Elemi. Jared Michael Giordano. Lindsay Ann Hildebrand. Kelsey Teresa Mantoni. Kent Allen McCann. <laughs> Blair Ann Robinson. Laura Francis Santoso. <laughs> Elizabeth Jean Tamaro.
Dr. Dave Hayton. Emily Elizabeth Ankernan. Andrew Rose Gilloli. <laughs> Connor Francis Grogan. Jordan Tomas Piazza. <laughs> Megan Reynolds. Robert Patrick Slamming. Caitlin D. Suarez. <laughs> Lucy Shu. Roger Sue Young. Kelly House, Head of House, Dr. Philip Fournier. Angela Beeler, mentor. Christopher Patrick Androsky, Jr.
Mark Antonio Diaz Coelho. Melanie Donahue. <laughs> Stephen M. Jessica Fang. <laughs> Jessica Marie Fournier. Trupti V. Engel. <laughs> Stephen Douglas Kruger. Mentor Sarah McGee. Michael Andrew Buckner. William David Fife. <laughs> Hannah Morris Hamad. Anna Lee Rundo Horndorf, Handorf. <laughs> Elizabeth Z. Lee. Nicholas Christopher Loso.
Michael Adam Mulferman. Brittany Michelle Aurelio Novak. Philip Fournier, mentor. Matthew Scott Breen. Catherine Ann Croak. <laughs> Michael William Kalfopoulos. John Thomas Ponty. <laughs> Vishal Saxena. Wang Schessler. <laughs> Lauren A. Testa. David Toomey. <laughs> Amanda Elizabeth Winkler. Quinn Sigamon House, Head of House, Dr. Diane Blake. Dr. Aaron Barlow, Mentor.
Corinne Elsa Ainsworth. Pritham Ashok Choli. Jonathan Joseph Gamel. Jason Lau. <laughs> Stephanie Marie Ludy. Camilla Dania Yu. <laughs> Dr. Glenn Kershaw, mentor. <laughs> Jessica. Ann Fortin. <laughs> Joshua Seth Kolikoff. Jesse Eli Moskowitz. <clears throat> Hannah Rose Rosenfield. Brent Richard Shell. <laughs> Jeffrey Michael Sumner.
Yan Emily Yuan. Dr. Peter Metz, mentor. Ryan James Burns. Caitlin Josephine McCann. <laughs> Alex John Newberry. Catherine Hendren Rose. <laughs> David Matthew Stein. Danielle Rebecca Trachamus. Dr. Dee Dee Blake, mentor. Emily Yun C. Fan. <laughs> Peter James Georgiakis. Alexander Brian Miller. <laughs> Tron Nuak Bo Nuan. Yevin Allen Rowe. <laughs> 
Ava Rone. Tatnick House, Head of House, Dr. P.Y. Fan. Dr. Nancy Bennett, mentor. Oh, Raghu Kiran Apasani. Kristen Ann Bevington. Patrick William Gibbons. Rachel Ying Mai Lei. Okay. Jessica Helene Plager. Balaj Rai. Brooks Jacob Willer. Dr. Timothy Gibson, mentor. Umar Sukumar Desai. Maximilian Orlowski Hoffman.
Tu Nok Tan Win. Sarah Julianne excuse me, Palmer. Jerome John Rogic. Ruth C. Silva. Dr. Thomas Halpin, mentor. Rebecca Engel. Jessica. Kelly. <laughs> Jacob Maurice Modest. Brandon Smith. <laughs> Zachary Noah Weitzner. Emily Rose Ziedi. Henry Chase Bradford IV. <laughs> Matthew Charles Carroll.
Catherine Siepel. Allison Aaron. Michael Lawrence Frizzoli. I think it would be appropriate now for one final round of applause for this great class, huh? It's now my pleasure to introduce student representatives from the class of 2016, Malik Mozawi, Jots Namula, and Emily Suther, who will lead the class of 2018 in reciting the oath printed on the back of your program. Okay, you may be seated for one more moment, please.
So there's a little bit of a back story here that I think I need to tell all of you. Uh, a few years ago, we had a student who could not get their coat on. And literally, it took almost two minutes, and it went on. It was very painful. <laughs> and last year, we had a group of students that couldn't hug. I mean, it was awful. <laughs> and it is clear that the lore goes down from class to class, because we have a group here that can put their coats on with ease, and when they do, they hug like no other, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Now, uh, where are you, Stephen? We're about to get up. You want to fix your hair one more time before we go out? Get, you want to get up? Yeah, let's have it. Come on, here we go. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well done. Well done. <laughs> so I want to, I want to uh, welcome all of you to the UMass family. We haven't had a chance to see all of you together here um, since your uh, daughters and sons have come to our institution. But ours is a very special place. It's, it's made special first and foremost because of our students. And it's a tremendous privilege for our faculty to have, to have the opportunity to guide these students over their professional uh, learning experience here at UMass. And we're delighted that you could join us this afternoon. We're embarking what's, on what's going to be a tremendous journey together over the next several years. And the excitement that you feel uh, generated by these outstanding students uh, will continue into the years ahead, and we look forward to the opportunity to spend uh, many special moments together. Uh, I have the opportunity to develop uh, relationships with each of the classes, and I have to tell you that uh, each class I have a little different relationship with. This one is going to be very special. What other class would ever have the chance to dump a bucket of ice water on the chancellor's head? <laughs> And uh, from the first day we've been together, it was clear to me that this class and, and our faculty were going to have a very special relationship. And I can already tell you that I, I feel that way with me. I have the opportunity to, uh, I ask each of the students to come and, and lunch in small groups so I can get to know them. And we're, we're well in the way with this class. And it's been really a delight to get to know you and to, uh, and to hear of your hopes and the ideals of, of you're joining our institution, and I look forward to uh, wonderful times together. Uh, we have a very nice reception planned now, and we look forward to getting to meet, as mentioned earlier, I know that the mentors very much want to meet the members of your families, and all of us want to have a chance to extend a UMass welcome to you. Let me thank Dr. Irwin again for his very wonderful comments. Uh, let me thank our dean for his leadership of our medical school. We have the finest dean in American medicine, and we're very fortunate about that. I'd like all of you, please, to thank the members of our faculty who are here today. Too. <laughs> What's best about this class, and I hope you can appreciate this, we now have a group of 125 new colleagues, and that's very special in our profession. When we take our oath, or when you take your oath at commencement, we profess that we will t teach those who come behind us in our profession. And so today we're welcoming 125 new members to our profession, and to have you as colleagues is really a very special privilege for all of us here at UMass. I'd like to now ask Dr. Michelle Pugner, who is this year's recipient, the, the 2014 recipient of the Chancellor's Medal for Distinguished Service, to come forward to collect the University Mace to lead our recessional. I'd like to ask all the members of our family and friends to remain in their seats until the faculty and students have left the room to join us on the patio and the cafe behind us for refreshments. It's wonderful to have all of you here today. Thank you very much.
okay. Usually I look at the footage afterward just to see, you know. Yeah, but I know like, at I one point I could hear you. And you're like, okay. <laughs> it felt natural. It so did seem. See. Yes. At least I didn't stand up, which was yeah, nice. Yeah. So that was a little bit easier for me to. But um, all of a sudden we had about eight faculty members that showed up when we needed to get seats. But we had a visually Thank impaired you. gentleman here who needed the room so that he could get through. And okay. so we were. Um, Thank you.